Okay, Dr. Roxana Myers um, received her bachelor's degree in tropical horticulture from University of Hawaii at Hilo, got a PhD in plant pathology specializing in nematology from UH Manoa. She's been here with us at PBARC working as a research nematologist, what, 10 years maybe? 10 years. Uh, time flies. Um, <laughs> and um, she works on all things related to nematodes, which is a very tough problem in itself, um, incredibly difficult. But she takes a variety of approaches to solving issues um, related to parasitic nematodes, including you know, cultural practices such as disinfestation, efficacy of nematicides, um, using predatory nematodes and entomopathic um, nematodes in biological control systems, and then, of course, working on the transformation and development of crops with resistance to nematodes. So, welcome, Thank Roxana. You. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here to speak with you about my favorite subject, and it'll soon be yours after you hear this talk. <laughs> so, um, Today I'm going to just focus on two of the projects. Um, as Dr. Wall mentioned, I work on many different approaches um, to nematodes, but today we're going to focus on anthurium, and I will talk about one, uh, chemical control, and the second will be developing host plant resistance. Okay, but first, my normal introduction, just in case nobody knows what these interesting little creatures are. Um, nematodes are microscopic, non-segmented worms. Um, they have a stylet, um, which is used for piercing the plant cell, and uh, that's how they ingest the contents. And they cause billions of dollars in damage to crops uh, worldwide. So even though you may not have heard about it, it's a big problem for agriculture. So the way that they damage the plants is they destroy and they weaken the root system. Um, they interfere with the uptake of water and nutrients. This causes stunting and also reduction in yields which is why we're here today. Um, anthuriums will see a reduction in the flower size as well as the number of flowers that are produced. And this photo right here uh, demonstrates um, an infested root system. So it starts off when the nematode enters into the root, you'll get necrotic lesions. And then um, this allows other type of pathogens to enter in and you can get a complete uh, root rot over time. It's a slow process uh, compared to something like bacterial blight where you go out and one day it's all down. But over time, um, the plant gradually uh, gets small, you know, just gets stunted and nothing really happens and your yields um, are significantly reduced. Um, this is a video of the nematode we'll be talking about today, Rhodophilus similis. It's a migratory endoparasite. Um, it's found in the roots uh, and also the gobo. So when you're using um, cuttings as your method of propagation, even symptomless cuttings can harbor quite a number of these worms. So um, you have to be very careful with that. So my recommendation is if you can, start clean and stay clean. Um, use clean cinder. Watch for water movement from uh, areas that may be infested with nematodes and going into your shade houses. Um, train your staff in good sanitation practices because let me tell you, when they're out there working hard on your farm, they're not thinking about these invisible little worms, you know, under their feet. So it's really important that you don't start in an infested area and then go to clean areas. Um, even, you know, you're, theoretically, you know, your shoes could be carrying um, these nematodes. If it's possible, um, please use tissue culture plant material. If not, um, there's a nice technique that Dr. Hara um, worked with and um, Dr. Zhang, which they disinfested gobo with hot water baths at 122 degrees um, for 15 minutes will destroy the nematode. And I've seen some of the growers utilize this technique um, with good success. So it's nice to see um, there's another um, approach. But if you have them, here's what you can do about them. <laughs> Um, we're really lucky to have a new nematicide on the market. The active ingredient is fluopyram. And I've been working at um, trying to find ways to kill nematodes as much as I like them. Um, and this, uh, this product um, has been the most successful um, so far. So this um, experiment has been going on for quite a few years. We've tested a number of different products. And we're um, ending up um, focusing on fluopyrium right now. My collaborators, um, Joanne and Brian, um, have um, been so valuable in helping assist us with these experiments. 
So uh, this trial that I'll be talking about is one that we've um, been working on over the last year. Uh, it's been 16 months in the works. Um, what we wanted to test was the fluopyram um, with in combination with melicon, which is a biological control that's an egg parasite. So we thought if we can kill the vermiform and the egg stages, um, maybe in combination, you know, that would work out well. So we tested um, different rates, um, both of them independently and then combined. Um, one, we used the max max rate one-time application um, followed by every three months with the melicon and then um, indemnify and melicon together every three months um, at the regular label rate. And of course we compare this with the untreated control um, so we know that our product is working. Okay, so this was um, one of the biggest field trials that we've done. Um, thanks to our grower cooperators for letting us um, go and work on their farms. Uh, we used the Nupaho Red cultivar and we did nematode sampling of the cinder and the roots uh, quarterly and also um, our cooperators were kind enough to help us to take flower yield data. So this is the last um, uh, sampling that we did that I have the results for. Uh, we actually terminated the trial and um, I was fortunate enough to be able to take whole plant samples so we're still kind of working through that so next year I'll give you a little bit update if the numbers have changed but um, in the cinder you can see all the way on the left the C that's the control the untreated control and these are all the different combinations um, of the melicon and the uh, uh, fluopyram. So if you see the little letters on the top of the columns, that is um, how we tell if something is significant or not. So A um, would be different than B, and A and B was different than neither one. So everything except melicon alone seemed to reduce the nematode population. We saw similar results when we take root samples. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't any significance, but you can still see the trend with the control having the most nematodes and the treated seeing nematode suppression. Okay, so this experiment didn't have that great flower yield that I talked about last year, um, but we did see some significance um, between the control and the treatment where we treated um, with the fluopyram and the melicon every um, three months. And so that was different. And you look, this is the total flower yield over 16 months, but you can see um, you're still getting 100 more flowers. Um, in this, you know, very, you know, smaller area. So that's quite significant when it comes to yield. And um, even though we haven't done any economic analysis, I think it would be really interesting to see if that paid off in the end. And that's something I would like to do in the future. And I know the growers always ask me, how much does it cost? And, you know, am I going to make my money back? <laughs> so we'll include that as a component next year. Um, but we did see a lot of improved root development. So if you look at this control photo, that's what most of um, the roots look like. Non-existent, you just have the gobo and um, not even blackened roots, which I usually see in more of my potted plant assays. Um, but the treated, we're getting a lot of nice new root development, which is really exciting. And I think if we would have continued this project over time, we would have seen the results with the yield. Um, also with the canopy cover, um, we saw a significant difference between the control and two of the um, combination treatments. And so also in this photo here, I just wanted to show like you really can see the new root development kind of starting on the surface when you look at the different beds. So we were really um, excited to, to see that. And even though it didn't quite perform as well as previous um, trials, um, we still think it's, it's promising. So the populations were reduced, we had more robust root development, and we think what the problem was um, when we started this experiment, the, the plants were heavily infested. And so at that point, when we tried to take root samples for the pretreatment, there were hardly any roots to even take. So you know, if a plant is gone down that far, it's gonna take much, much longer to recover. And so I would like to say if you do notice um, signs of a nematode infestation, that you treat it early. Because the earlier you get to it, the better it's going to be able to bounce back. Um, but I didn't want you to feel too discouraged um, over my yield data, so I just wanted to remind you about last year's trial. Um, we got uh, lower nematode populations, um, flower yield was up, flower size was up, and um, we thought, yeah, this is, this is the thing. 
Um, remember this one trial, we actually had more extra largeness, um, significantly more. And so, you know, that makes the growers really happy to see that and uh, lots more flower numbers. Um, also with the canopy cover, um, you can just see, looking at the leaf, you're getting um, a lot more uh, bigger leaves, greener, it's more full in your field. And here was the nematode numbers. So this indemnifies the fluopyram and Luna uh, is a fungicide which contains fluopyram and also um, another fungicide, trifloxystropin. And this is the exciting news. Um, this is broad form and it's, it's the same thing as Luna. Um, it's the same amount of fluopyram and trifloxystropin and it's labeled for ornamentals in Hawaii. So finally, <laughs> we have something that we can recommend um, and this is a product by Bayer. So that's really great, and we're going to move on and test that again. Um, right now, we're working on a nematicide box trial um, out at Waikea. We're going to test the broad form, um, uh, the fungicide that I mentioned, um, the vellum, which is also the same as um, Indemnify, in combination with Movento, which is Spirotetramat. And I got that recommendation um, from Bayer's website. They recommend that for potato and walnut growers, that you use the two uh, synergistically, starting with the fluopyram and then your next applications are the Movento. Um, there's another new nematicide on the market, Nimitz, uh, which is fluosulfan. We're going to test that. Um, and Magistine, um, which is a uh, heat killed Burkholderia um, species and the untreated control. So we're already in the process of this. We have the um, nematodes have uh, been inoculated, which is great because the growers do not let me bring nematodes to their farm. And so I can put as many nematodes as I want per plant. Um, so that helps me get a higher level of infestation because I really want to see the damage right away. Um, we're going to do the same thing, nematode sampling of the cinder and the roots, um, flower yields. And then at the end, I can take all the plants up and cut them all up. And no one minds. Um, we've already started with the first treatments. Uh, this is what the trial looks like. These are our boxes to kind of simulate uh, cinder beds, but keep them contained at the same time. Um, but considering the last experiment we did, maybe the plants were too small, too heavily infested. These are too healthy <laughs> and way too big. So I'm hoping uh, we'll get to see some results soon. But if not, we'll just keep on going and let those nematodes reproduce until I see a difference. Because, um, oh, I didn't mention this at the beginning, which I always say, if you have healthy plants, your plants are going to be more tolerant to nematodes. So that's probably what I'm going to see in this trial. But uh, so I keep adding nematodes every chance I get. Um, but it's good to keep that in mind. And that goes for any plant pathogens. You know, if you give your plants that most optimum conditions, um, they're going to be able to withstand uh, some of these diseases. OK, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about host plant resistance. Uh, this is a project in cooperation with ARS at the um, U.S. National Arboretum. And most of the work um, that I'm going to talk about right now is done by Dr. Paulo Vieira, who's up there in Beltsville, Maryland. And it's so nice that they teamed up with us to um, help the Hawaii industry. Um, so what we did uh, was we did the transcriptome for the burrowing nematode, and that's like um, what John was talking about, looking at the DNA, but we're instead looking at the RNA, and that's like what genes are expressed. And so that can give us an idea about what genes are vulnerable to in the nematode, what genes make the nematode parasitize the plant. And if we can silence those genes, then that can be um, an option for us uh, to use as a method of control. And I'm still a big believer in the cystatin gene that Tracy talked about, and I'm very excited, and I know that is going to work, but it doesn't hurt to get an arsenal, you know, and find a bunch of other different genes that we can look at and study as well. And this is kind of a new method, like the, with the rainbow papaya, um, where you're silencing a gene um, instead of adding something new. So it's a little different approach. Uh, we're ex hopefully, um, we're going to see a lot of success with that. So we used the Illumina mRNA sequencing analysis. Uh, we took a mixed population of the burrowing nematode from a commercial anthurium farm. So we make sure you know, we got the right um, perpetrator. Uh, we got 106 million paired end reads. Uh, they did a transcriptome uh, assembly, which resulted in 44,000 transcripts. Oh, that's like a lot of data. <laughs> Um, and we matched it up to see what else was in um, the GenBank, and we got 57 matches. 
So this nematode hasn't been highly studied in this way, so we're getting a lot of new information. Um, and Paulo has worked with uh, Pratolinchus, which is a very similar nematode. So he showed in this picture here um, all the genes that are overlapping that are similar to different species of Pratolinchus, and that's what brought him in to collaborate with us. He, he wanted to take it another step and, and learn what else is new. But surprisingly, you think there would be more overlap um, on the genes, and these are all the different genes in categories for what their purpose is. And this just shows um, all the different purposes of each one. He, he blocked them all out. Um, so you have like metabolism, how they affect the environment, um, the cellular process. And OK, we have to narrow this down a bit. Um, so he looked at what he calls effector genes, which are the parasitism genes. That's the genes that make the nematode be able to dissolve cell walls, be able to um, infest its host. You know, if we can block these genes, we can stop the nematode from infesting a plant. So he identified uh, several ones that looked promising. Some were completely new, and some were similar to other um, nematode genes that he's worked with in the past. So he did an experiment where he wanted to make sure, are they in there? I mean, we see it on the data. But he did these really, um, this really nice work where he used um, some labeled fluorescent probes and he tried to find each of these different genes. And you can see they were in the esophagus, and the esophagus is where these um, proteins come out, and, and they're used to infect the plant. So um, the next step was we picked six. Um, six genes we thought that could silence movement and effector genes, these parasitism genes, and this is the six on the corner. And this UNC87 and PAT10 to me are really interesting because they affect movement. So when the nematode will eat the silencing constructs, they all of a sudden cannot swim anymore and they're just standing there straight. And so if they do that, they can't find the root of the plant. Um, so I'm pretty excited about those, and the other four are what these parasitism genes are. Um, so what they did was they transformed them into carrot hairy roots and sent them to me, and then this is where the fun begins, because I get to try all of these roots and see um, you know, how the nematodes are going to reproduce. So I'm going to do an in vitro assay um, where I will put nematodes on, let them do their thing and take them off and see what kind of results we get. And so, of course, the most promising ones um, we're going to take to the next level and put them into anthurium. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> and this is really fun. Um, so, here's just like some of the hairy roots that they sent us and Wow, they're really growing well here. So I said, oh, this is much easier to work with than Ethereum. <laughs> so this, this project should be a piece of cake. Um, Kathy has done a really nice job in um, getting our nematodes sterile and growing. Um, she has some um, hairy, hairy roots that she's, she's been developing up there. And you can see the nematodes coming out. And boy, they really like them. So we're going to have a lot of nematodes to work with. And we're really excited about um, you know, what new gene constructs can be developed. And I'd like to thank all the grower collaborators who have just been so helpful to getting this research done. And um, especially, I would like to thank um, Kathy Mello, who does so much work here for, for the nematode group. Thank you. Oh, question. <laughs> How does fluorocyte work as far as killing or immobilizing, or immobilizing nematodes? You know, that is a good question, and I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have seen that, you know, it's, it's the interesting thing was it actually started on the market as a fungicide. Right. And then they realized, oh, wait, this is doing something with nematodes. And there wasn't much out there. So um, I think they still don't really, you know, understand um, the actual mode, you know, of action. So it doesn't kill them. It immobilizes them. No, I think it's a true, um, a, a, a true nematocide. Okay. Yeah, it does. Take them out. Okay. <laughs> so, silly question. This uh, broad form is the first that's been uh, labeled. Yes. Right. Yes. So, would you have, have we run any tests with uh, extension? Do, do we have like a rate recommendation? Can we start using it already? Oh, um, yes. You you can use it, and I would say 
Follow the label rate. Follow the label yeah. rate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the test that we did in the past, we did go a little higher than the label rate, but, you know, of course, we're not allowed to do that. So um, I think you're still going to see, you know, good result um, using the label rate for, anti so for ornamentals. Recommendation is we drench it, we spray it over the top. Um, we were like sprinting it where, <laughs> yeah, so we apply it to the leaves till runoff because you, you do want to get it into that root system, yeah. Yeah, Joanne, Joanne was all about it. You did drop a foil pan and mel what? Mela? Oh, Melicon. Melicon. So, so the results was the uh, combination was best, or the, he I noticed the heavier dosage was more effective. Right, the, it's, it's not that the dosage was heavier, it was just the, the application intervals. Oh. So with the um, fluopyram, there's a maximum rate per year that you can use. So you could, you know, when we hit it all one time, um, I don't think that was as effective as breaking it down, you know, and then doing it every quarter and then Still, that's, that equals the maximum rate per year, but you're just doing it quarterly instead. So I think that um, would be the best. I'm not sure if I can, you know, solidly say that you know you should use the Melicon because we didn't see like these huge significant differences. Okay. Um, so I I don't know if I I could go that far. Um, but it's you know difficult to say with the stunting of the plants. Too. Did you try, you try with a different uh, amount, of, amount of size? Are you still using the whole red? Um, no, my new child um, is Toyama Peach, which I'm starting to believe is tolerant to nematodes. <laughs> so if you have a nematode problem, try that. <laughs> because um, we just keep adding the nematodes, and whew, I'm not seeing the, the scenting that I would like to see. So, I, you know, um, yeah, probably would have. In retrospect, been nice to test the same cultivar across, you know, all of these different trials because we've been doing this for years. But usually, um, it's a matter of opportunity, you know, um, who has an infested plot I can use or who has some extra plants. Um, yeah, we were very fortunate that that the growers gave us some plants to work with. And is Fortepan systemic, transgenic? What? No. <laughs> Yeah. Just contact or what? Yeah, it's contact. Just contact. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Any more questions for Roxana? Great. Okay. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. We all